Hi, everyone out there in Facebook Live Land, as well as YouTube, because you'll be watching this on YouTube later, I expect. I am Susan Kerbick, and I am joined with Janice Boyton in our continuing series discussing facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. This is sponsored by the About Time um, Project. I hope that you like our videos on YouTube, as well as like our project on Facebook and and set your alerts so that when we're live, you can become notified that we're live. Um, everything is interactive here. We can see your comments on Facebook. I have your your comments right here on my screen. So if you do need to ask a question or some clarification from um, Janice, myself, or our guest today, um, we would appreciate it. I want you to know I can see about five comments before they fall off the screen. So <laughs> if it's something really important, um, please repeat your question and or if I like your comment, that means I'll prob I'm waiting for a moment to probably ask the question at a comfortable time in the conversation. So I'll, I'll just make a note somewhere. You can see me probably trying to write your question down. So anyway, um, I would like to have Janice introduce our speaker today. This is going to be really, really exciting. So I hope that you guys are got your popcorn and you're all set and ready to go. Well, um, I'm really excited about the speaker, Brian Gorman. He um, is one of the people that I've talked with that actually has uh, the same historical experience with FC that I do, but um, in a totally different viewpoint. So I'm really anxious to, to hear what he has to say. Um, we want to just mention that um, we're not going to go into um, facilitated communication, what it, you know, like in deep detail, except to say that it's a it's a technique used with um, um, people with severe communication difficulties that's been proven um, to be facilitator authored and not um, not the person with disabilities isn't doing the communicating. We have. Um, taped some videos before that actually do a deep, does a deep dive. We show videos and all that kind of stuff of what FC is and kind of break it down, but that's not what this talk is today. Um, this talk is um, more about um, the the critical side of things and in particular the um, some of the issues around the law and using discredited techniques in the classroom. Um, so I'm going to let Brian um, kind of give us a, um, an overview of who he is and what his experience is, and then we'll, we'll start talking about um, how he found out about FC and all that stuff. So Brian, if you could just kind of give us a little background and, and where you are now. Sure, sure. It's kind of all uh, intertwined in uh, the sense of my trajectory really started as an undergraduate. At, you know, at typical for undergraduate psychology courses, you um, are expected to participate in a professor's research lab in some way, you know? Yeah, and so, every, you know, um, that helps the professors uh, run their research and it's good for students to get exposure. And um, I went to Stony Brook, Stony Brook University and we had Ted Carr there and he um, had a fantastic lab uh, working with folks with, um, with uh, developmental disabilities and specifically Oops. The, uh, my screen is kind of frozen. I don't know if that's yeah. happening. You that were talking about mind? Ted Carr and then it kind of froze on you. You went kind of- Yeah, it just, I just got the message. Your internet connection is unstable. Is that me? Yeah, it came up on my- not on ours. Hey, let me know when that happened. Yeah, okay. All right, yeah. So, um, the world as an soon. undergraduate, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I used to. Uh, Comcast in Baltimore, hopefully it holds up. Um, and uh, but anyway, so as an undergraduate, I was uh, working with uh, autistic children through this project, just, you know, one at a time in the laboratory setting. And that was a, you know, just a, a true undergraduate course, really. Uh, a whole new thing, and that led to um, basically uh, getting connections with the people who worked in Ted Carr's lab, and then uh, the his lab had a working relationship with an, an organization called DDI, Developmental Disabilities Institute, and they're a really good outfit. Um, and uh, then I ended up working 
uh, for them. And uh, I ended up getting a master's in psychology and doing more work for DBI as a master's level psychologist, you know, uh, basically on the behavioral aspect of things and uh, behavior plans and basically had to troubleshoot and help um, special education teachers, you know, manage a classroom which has you know, uh, students with different, presenting with different problems. And, and so the, you know, behaviorist can focus on that and be the team leader on those issues, draw up a behavior plan. So I was, uh, it, it got into it that way. And, and and it was through that position at FC. But, um, and after that, though, to finish the kind of career background stuff, I, so the course that I got the master's in psych, and then uh, I did administrative work in the field of uh, disabilities, and then I went to law school and found a, a niche, you know, science and the law, and I went to law school kind of with this, uh, the controversy of facilitated communication uh, kind of uh, in the background and kind of an inspiration to you know, look, look at areas of law as I'm studying it. And that led to a couple of the papers, the first few papers. And uh, then I became a public defender for a number of years, uh, six years. And then uh, I got to the academic world. So now I'm teaching, I'm an associate professor at uh, Towson University in Maryland. So I look at science and the law and I also look at Homeland Security. So science and the law actually kind of takes you, um, you know, uh, there as well. There's like um, you know policy issues there that are very interesting for another talk. But, uh, wow. but yeah, so that's basically the the background there. Um, if the uh, the introduction to FC, how I came across it, uh, you know, so DDI professional, uh, wonderful organization, and um, you know, and one way that it defined itself was. It took the most challenging students and clients in the region, so that's that was a, like a point of pride, and that our professional team, you know, uh, uh, come to us. You know, they, we, we, you know, uh, you're not getting into another place. Try us. We're gonna we'll we'll, we'll take anybody and everyone. We're, you know, uh, it was a great professional ethos and uh, you know, uh, you know. Um, protocol all the way through. And when I was there, um, uh, let's see, I just remember, you know, I, you know, so I was one of many clinicians. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I remember an administrator who was two, you know, uh, two levels up uh, and was just saying, oh boy, you know, uh, the, the news of the day that there's this breakthrough called facilitated communication and, um, Hey, if you follow this protocol, then uh, you could help people type, you know, hand, hand over hand, help them help folks with, uh, who are nonverbal, who are otherwise understood to have a, a, a low IQ through intelligence testing and uh, be severe, profound dis mental disability. But uh, this proves that wrong. It proves that there's a way to connect with these folks if you go with the hand over hand typing technique and uh, that kind of came out of you know, say Syracuse University. And so we just kind of heard that third hand, I mean like uh, at work an incidental thing. And as, as, as it was you know, this thing that was news in the field and overnight sensation. And, and, the, and one thing that was unique about it was the work you do when you're working in special education, you, you don't expect the evening news to cover something related to your field too often, you know? And, and with FC, it, it was all of a sudden uh, 60 Minutes or CBS and, and New York Times. It's fascinating. Do you, remember, do you remember what year that was? I was just going to ask, what year are we talking about? Is it the early 90s? Or late 90s? Or early 90s, yes. Early, that's yeah, all of Janice involved, well, right? Yeah, well, Frontline came out in 1993, and then there, but before that, in 91 and 92, there were um, uh, 60 Minutes did a couple of shows. Uh, I believe it was 91, 92, somewhere in there. I've seen the 60 Minute thing. I'm going to write that down. I've got to see that. Yeah, they yeah. Um, they actually promoted it at first, and then they, um, when I was on it at one point um, in 94, I think. They they did a critical view, but um, oh, I didn't realize you were on it. So we're gonna see you with different hair, and you're all like <laughs> punked out in the '90s style, Janice. Something, yeah. <laughs> I 
I haven't, we haven't been able to track down that technology. video. You haven't seen it? No, I've seen it, but I haven't been able to get a copy of it. What? Yeah. I had it a long time ago on VCR, but they, I can't, nobody's been able to track down the actual. Do you have the VCR somewhere? Tape? Because you can get those. No, I can't find it. No. He was so good. Go look at the birdies. Somebody must have it. It was Hugh Downs. It was, it aired, I know, I know when it aired because Nixon died the night that it was supposed to air. So it's the Friday after Nixon died. That's the only reason why I remember the date. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, Brian. So a little know. tangent here. It, it, well, no, it, it brings us back to that time, you know, um, as yeah. I was going to do, well, but uh, definitely, yeah, I think when um, uh, the administrator was, Ray and like so he was he was just mentioning this uh, incidentally and um, and so that must have been kind of just right at that breakthrough. So FC came to the states in like eighty nine, but it was just in Syracuse uh, in the fall of eighty nine. Uh, folks there at Syracuse were kind of having breakout sessions, introducing it to folks in local schools there. So it's just really local grassroots to, they're just there but then it exploded so uh yeah the, so spring of 1990 and onward any time from then it could have been uh you know when when that happened but i think uh yeah 91 maybe something like that but um but yeah anyway um so like i i, I was doing my thing uh, and a sizable organization it was just something that you know boy this and, and my reaction uh you know uh was just like okay i mean um and you know because um i was like almost too good to be true i mean so uh and i didn't see i didn't see anything i just heard something from ray you know the, a boss and uh and talking about getting canon communicators and so so there's stuff brewing with that that's kind of like i first heard about it yeah so and a canon then, communicator is is like a it was like a um a portable typing machine that had a tape that oh, when the Canon, it was the it name. Would, okay. Yeah, it would type out the And the had letter. a little paper that came out or something. Yeah. The manufacturer's yeah. Canon. I think they made typewriters yeah. and this is kind of... Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And you kind of got that ticker tape of like, okay, yeah. uh, this is, these are the word, the letters printed from the process. Yeah, so, um, and I went about my business and so, uh, you know, just by per periphery and, uh, you know, so basically I was pretty new to... Um, being a young behavior specialist uh, and uh, you know rolling up my sleeves and uh, you know doing the less glamorous work it, it's you know, no miracles involved uh, but there's a lot of research and there's a lot of observation and there's a lot of um, you know uh, you know getting the team together and homework and getting folks to be on the same page and look for the progress and measure it and you know the the data guy in the background and making it functional for folks. So you're the nerd on the side, making it uh, appeal and functional in the classroom. So I had plenty to do. And so I wasn't part of that FC uh, process there, but in DDI, as I said, there was the, you know, a wonderful academic connection and the professionals there, even you know, aside from that. So, uh, so it was, it was a very good environment that way. And then like Eberlin, uh, Mike Everlin was uh, there and one of the folks there in that professional group. And just the anticipation was in that we were going to use it. It was just so we took it at face value as everyone did. Okay, this is a wonderful new thing. You got to try it. This is happening. And, uh, you know, so it didn't start out uh, with any particular skepticism, but there are pros. And at that level with in the organization, in terms of research, what you do is you test it and to see what we're working with. So thanks, what is it, how does it go? Yeah, we're gonna use it, check it out, but we're gonna test it. And that was, and, and uh, that was wonderful exposure to that whole process. And I think they use that classic T um, format. Uh, uh, if you've seen Prisoners of Silence, I think they, they showed that apparatus. You basically you set up a T so that the person facilitating can't see what the uh, disabled person can see. So the I, you know the, the the being that the problem is facilitator influence with FC, and uh, you know uh, Janice, you, you can speak to this. Uh, you have such expertise on this. 
um, that, uh, you know, with the uh, blocking the ability to see what the student can see, then, uh, it, then the facilitator can't unconsciously just be typing about what they both are exposed to. So if they're shown different things, the facilitator who's helping, you know, we'll, you know, we'll see a boat versus a hamburger. And so the person testing says, what did you see? And if the adult who's assisting the facilitator sees a hamburger and the, the disabled child saw a boat and you get the answer hamburger, then it's like, wow, that was part of those were those answers that said, wait a minute. This is coming from, you know, the adults who thinking that they're helping guide the hand, but not lead it. But uh, that's this unique, really aspect of this the unintended um, subconscious influence, uh, Ouija board effect. Yeah, I was thinking the Ouija board effect of somebody having a blindfold on necessarily, and and still somebody with a blindfold on and somebody without blindfold on is looking at the board of what's happening, you know, but not having right. their hands on the planchette. Whereas the people who are, who are, have their hands on the planchette are, um, are, yeah, are going yeah. to be <laughs> moving yeah. the planchette around and can't see it. Yeah. It just, it was an experiment on brain games not too long ago. Yeah. That, and to see it, it's very convincing that it looks like the adult is a, is a facilitator that's helping it looks like they're just merely helping and um, the information is coming from the uh, disabled child um, but when you test it and that's what science is about you verify and uh, you control the, the situation the environment to see if you're getting results that you know visually and situationally it seemed like it worked and that was fantastic and but when you tested it it's like well you know we didn't it wasn't uh, following through as what it yeah. appeared so and then but people and people tried it and it was encouraged you know that's the way it was unrolled uh, uh you know introduced to everybody you know give it a try and people did and you know I, plenty of times so, oh and look it works with johnny it doesn't work with mary it works with sally it doesn't work with jim and you know it just that's it was like little fires starting up and then the studies started to happen at least so we had that in a, in a smaller situation um, that, you know, because we had uh, a special ed school, we had adult settings, we had residential, so we had all these different facilities and, and this new phenomenon was happening and, you know, so people were trying and, and it's working here, it's not working there. And then Everlyn and, and the rest of the folks on that study, they gave us the, you know, uh, definitive uh, guidance on that. It just said, oh, we tested so it and this is going on. That's interesting. Eberlin and the, the ODHEC Center and Eberlin must and uh, Eberlin um, for DDI was was doing the testing about they must have been doing it at about the same time. Um, and they I read the Eberlin study over the weekend and we can post a link to that afterwards. Um, um, and they were pretty excited about using facilitated communication. And in fact, with facilitator authorship wasn't actually part of their original testing they they gave they gave the they matched um the best pairs together the facilitator and the students that were were and there were 10 facilitators and i think there were 21 um, clients and um, they matched the best people together um, and they actually gave them 20 hours of practice in between just to make they gave them every chance and they did uh, one thing that's different about their testing that's not involved in the proponent testing was that they um they did a post test a pre-test so they measured the skills of the clients before they did facilitated communication then they gave them 20 hours of practice with it and then they tested them again um, and what and you Brian you can tell what the results of the, the study was yeah well um, just you know uh, I don't have it down to the weeds for, for Evelyn's study back then but it that it wasn't supported it wasn't a valid communication which is the theme for all of the um, you know uh, valid legitimate you know, well-controlled scientific studies you know so uh, and this is one of the things you get folks, you know, who um, who are proponents for it, advocates for it, and that's different than being 
looking at a scientist for it, or someone who's looking at it through a scientific lens. And um, but uh, and I'm kind of channeling uh, Gina Green right now. Uh, talked to her a few times. She was the, one of the folks who was out there um, uh, leading, and I think she was available for some court cases and such. But I did speak to her for some of um, paper, and um, you know, and and. and with her, herself, like looking at it and publishing and being out there, it's like, yeah, um, you know, uh, there's, while well, you, you know, you get various results in a scientific paper, um, you know, when they're well controlled, it, this is consistent. And right. another uh, expert who's out there, uh, uh, James, um, uh, James Todd, who's yeah. a professor of Eastern Michigan, I believe. Yeah, and, and I like his line about it, which is, uh, it is the most, discredited, you know, uh, of therapy or technique out there in the field of disabilities. And we get one of them because a lot of snake oil cures come along because people, you know, want hope. And then people, you know, the field, you know, wants them and people want to have them and uh, different cures or, or uh, shortcuts and things to work better than uh, better mousetraps and such. But, uh, you know, this one has been tested ad nauseum. And that's that's uh, Professor Todd's point. And yeah, so it's not there's no ambiguity here. When you talk to the experts out there, um, everyone's study and OD hack to the folks who have stuck with it to today, nothing has been given as many chances, and uh, it has been refuted as much as SFC in this field. So it's that yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it it's. It's amazing the um, consistency of the the academic testing, even though even though in the mainstream it it continues to um, have a stronghold. But in the academic testing, um, it's definitely you know starting from '93. Even actually, there's some cases before that that Denmark actually debunked FC in the 1970s. So. Um, in 1998, you wrote an article called Facilitated Communication in America, Eight Years and Counting. So that was interesting <laughs> to, to see. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, say that again? I said that was very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, An overview of FC and, and, oh yeah, it was very good. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what led you to write that paper? Yeah. I mean, like, e even in the title, it, it, and that was written eight years after it was introduced, this new miracle cure, and and counting. And so that was the title to say, this has got some staying power, all right? And that, you know, at that point in 1998 when it was being published, that it, this is like it's, it's a prediction, it's going to be around. Uh, when at the time, internet connection, am I, can you hear me okay? It's, yeah, it's, only, it's only for a few seconds. Yeah. A um, so I'll, I'll kind of pause when I see that my internet. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's wait. Um, yeah, and, and so basically, um, you know, uh, through law school, I, I looked at the law for uh, the other article. And then there was this other material coming up on the finances and kind of the, the story that uh, this other, that, that was developing on its own. So uh, that had to be memorialized that was my thinking and we had the internet and, it, and so that period of time in the 1990s it was um you know things were getting put on the internet from like syracuse university and looking at the finances and, uh there's something um called the the irs form nine uh 990 and uh, oh yeah, I know non <laughs> you have yeah so for a non-profit yeah you know, no profits have it I don't, a 990. So it's kind of famous, you know, it's a mainstay, it's a, and that's a public document because um, if you're going to have nonprofit status and not pay taxes, well, in exchange for that status, you have to have this transparency financially that you are indeed a charitable organization, not a profitable organization. And anyway, um, so getting those in the 90s at that time, asking questions about the finances, that was the time. And I knew it had to be um, memorialized, captured. Uh, in the law, uh, you know, what we talk about, the contemporaneous notes. So they, they have value as evidence. So my recollection to 1998, I could tell you all sorts of stories, it could be accurate, 
Give me a little bit. What are Yep. Pause. Did we lose him? Let's take a snapshot of that. Let's not forget financial motivations, background aspect of it that was going on. So we haven't really, in these talks, we haven't really talked about um, the uh, the two leaders of of the in the in the organization of facilitated communication, Rosemary Crosley in Australia, and um, Douglas Bicklin in Syracuse, and then Syracuse University has been um, the ground zero for the United States um, push for facilitated communication. They still are. And so can you can you talk about what you learned about um, some of that, the finances? Yeah, and, and it still leads to like one of the mysteries that surround it uh, in terms of this institutional support. And that's been one of the things that's kept it alive. And the fact that FC had the institutional support of Syracuse University at that time, that's what spoke to it has a future, you know? Um, and, uh, Basically, I guess if you talk to administrators at any university, I uh, don't care how big their endowment, they're going to say, oh, we need more money, you know. Uh, so, but Syracuse University did have a precarious financial situation for four years. Uh, I think they do have an endowment as of late, but uh, 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, you know, uh, but as I say, all college administrators will probably tell you that, but they really did in, in the way that they faced questions as to whether or not they were to cut programs is that severe. Mm -hmm. And this is the one major event that's kind of the backdrop for the financial stuff. Um, dem demographics, uh, there were um, less freshmen heading to U.S. colleges and universities starting 1990, early 1990s. So looking at birth rates, the folks in the, you know, the world of academia, they were like, whoa, a lot less, uh, you know, births at this point in time. So when our 18 year olds come this year in 1990, uh, they knew there was less applications. So Syracuse situation was that they were heavily dependent on tuition revenue. And uh, so some universities you know, they can get research funds and they get a piece, you know, support, you know, so institutional support of the research funds, uh, tuition uh, revenue, and then maybe endowments. So there, there's a couple of ways they get their revenue to stay afloat as an operation. And they're very expensive entities. Uh, but Syracuse was heavily dependent on tuition, which made them uniquely uh, vulnerable in the 1990s. And they lost, uh, oh, let's see, from this financial crisis that rolled out for a couple of years. So, you know, the birth, it, uh, there was a decline in birth rates at a certain you know, period of time, which resulted in fewer applicants to colleges. They got hit by that respectively. They projected, they knew this was coming in the mid of the, what you, the folks in the college business, they, they look, how many are born this year, they, they project out. So it was known, uh, very early on, but the pressure built, and it was known across campus. It was one of these, you know, uh, awful situations where, hey, we have big cutbacks. And uh, one of the quotes in that article was from an administrator, in Vinco, Vinco, I believe, and he put out this, you know, uh, you know, I mean, you know, it was kind of chaotic and a lot of pressure all around. But to have someone who's as high ranking as he was to say, yeah, a faculty have to be entrepreneurial. So basically, oh. you had you know you had to bring in money you know, and, and to survive here. And uh, at Syracuse University, I don't have the numbers of the school, but I think that we're in the 500 to 600 full-time faculty positions cut between retirement and um, you know being let go in this couple of the early 1990s because they you know the budget cuts severe. Wow. And FC brought in money. So, uh, so you, you know, at that time, it was like, we, you know, have to capture what's going on in the background. So there's so much going on with uh, it uh, in the normal course, but this going on, because like, why would the administrators support this? 
and it's, it's you know if it's a risk to the public and it's going to hurt the damage of the school uh, reputation of the school which professors at Syracuse raised there are professors on campus at Syracuse who had nothing to do with this said what's going on here why, why are we supporting this institute oh, and if you really get into the weeds with the timeline of this FC Institute at, which was open to the public to promote this and they brought in money uh, from that these seminars uh, they started running it informally out of the department like in the fall they did an outreach thing so and uh, so in the fall of 1989 I believe or 1990 one of those uh, they it was just right there but then they people coming to campus before they were an official institute recognized by the administration. So they were piloting it, they're trying it out. And then an administration, so it wasn't like, hey, you want an institute, you, you form your own institute. They needed permission for that backing to have this facilitated communication institute. I got my uh, That's interesting. Uh, so you know, they had to get approval yeah, we get it. I was just going to say, um, we get the question a lot, how much does Syracuse University administration know what's going on? And it seems from yeah. from what you're saying and what's been reported in, in your article and others, that they do know what's going on. They're turning a blind eye. Well, there's a, there's a, a term of art in the law, which is to know, no. Okay, the, so someone knew or shouldn't have known, or should have known in their position. And they certainly should have known. And there's a lot more, they spoke to it. Uh, they, many of them spoke to it directly as in, you know, expressing, expressing knowledge of it. Uh, it was a storage case in, I think, 1995. So they knew about it then, you know, they went to court. Uh, and and um, they had a lucky day in court, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, the judge basically dismissed the case, kind of, um, he just said, uh, uh, he was an enthusiastic professor acting prematurely. Just, he, he spread the word prematurely. So, the, you know, it wasn't that they failed the person bringing the case, alleging that Syracuse was engaged in fraud, profiting from this false, uh, you know, uh, promise, and this, uh, making money from that, which caused harm to them. Because of, I believe that case, uh, there were false allegations of sexual abuse through the assisted typing facilitated communication. So, you know, an adult in the school helped communicate with a student who was disabled, and um, they were projecting, you know, a sexual abuse that didn't happen. So, the parent, you know, the child was separated from the family for a period of time when uh, social services got involved. And then, you know, at the end of the day, after uh, well, more than a day, uh, after the family went through hell, then it was found out that, oh, FC is not valid, and the child didn't communicate that, and then there was no other corroborating evidence saying that there was sexual abuse from the child. So it was all um, not real. And so then they sued Syracuse, and the judge gave Syracuse uh, and Professor Bicklin a path, both sued Bicklin. And, and the university, and um, basically just for being premature. It was like, just like, yeah. it's like, hey, he was excited and he wanted to share, but that's, that was part of the narrative. Just wanted to share with his mist. And, and the, the elements of fraud weren't met. Uh, he, he just said, good intent, didn't mean to do this, uh, and kind of saw it in the, in the lens of like academic freedom. So that's the other thing. Okay. And when you look at the series, which isn't much of a case because it was dismissed, um, you want to look at, um, on the other hand, the Federal Trade Commission uh, cases, and they had two businesses who got on the bandwagon and like the Canon communicator, they offered some other kind of communicator. And they made the same claims. Obviously, they, you know, they took them from the Syracuse group and said, hey, um, buy this communicator and you could do, all, do these wonderful things. 
but the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, they, uh, there was a report made to them, they did the right thing, which was so rare in the history of this for um, you know, prosecutors like that. And, but their economic, their civil side of things. And they said, hey, you business, that's a fraudulent practice. You can't do that. Then they had um, a, a, an agreement. So, so, you know, the way that goes, they started a court action, uh, but it, it, it gets settled with an order that's agreed to, that they agree to stop promoting the, the, that facilitated communication to basically reach normal intelligence within somebody who is otherwise known by professionals to not be able to be uh, communicative and has a very low functioning IQ. Can't make this basically the best for this miracle cure promise, which Syracuse made. But Syracuse was able to do that, got a pass because of academic freedom. If you're a regular for profit business, the FC, FTC did the right thing and set up that precedent. Hey, you can't make that promise. That's right. And then big trouble if they, they continued that. So that, that was about some precedent there, but a huge, big dichotomy. Yeah, it it just seemed it's a shame, really. It seems like there's a there was a difference um, um, my back. between there. They were mints and words, really, between qualitative and quantitative studies, and they were they were sort of interpreting the evidence. Uh, we we um, sat in on a on a workshop. Um, and a recent, a fairly recent one. And the, the question was raised about, you know, the, the um, facilitator influence and the, the response from the leadership was still, was we're choosing to look at the evidence differently. That, that always amazes me because, I mean, the evidence is evidence, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's sort of like, we get, I mean, that's not new for us, for you know our our where we are in history and our country and all that to 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 make that statement, but it's it's really frustrating to to know that the um, the academic community and the uh, has been very methodical about looking into facilitated communication and change the 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 scientific community actually even changed their their testing protocols a little bit because F, uh, the Syracuse was saying, "Oh, well, it's too it's too much like a laboratory, you know, to to control the the which isn't true, but that was the argument. Right. So that then they so they changed it to natural settings and they bent over backwards. The the scientific community bent over backwards to make this thing to find the evidence for the people that should have had the evidence to begin with, and they just cannot find it. And I'm curious, have you, this pro-FC academic circles, uh, real lived, real dash lived. So you're talking science stuff, but real lived, which is no science, and that um, it, 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 and it, it provides kind of art cover if you're an FC advocate saying, it works for me, you know, and let me tell you stories about how it works for me, and then here's a poem that was written, and here was a situation, and all this anecdotal stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which is their alternative view, and that's they built this whole network and uh, ethos and uh, approach based upon a non avoiding the science so. right so say that it, we asked him and he said it works right real we, yeah, oh, we yeah. asked the in, in a real lived sense yeah not right. in that science cold science and uh and then the other part of that is like uh yeah um because when you, you put it the cold science then kind of comes the criticism of the critics, you know, uh, and uh, you know, like, oh, them, and like, it was like, what? No, because you know, it, it's political on their end, you know, because there's the scientific community has you know just done the right thing and gone through the motions and bent over backwards, as you said, and it's not supposed to work like this. Mm -hmm. That when something is not supported, something is not valid, that they keep coming back 
You know, it's like the Terminator movie, the first one there. Like, I, I, Terminator kept, he wouldn't die, he wouldn't go away. And here it's the same thing. When, so, you know, some, and because things are not supported, there are new ideas and novel techniques that people think in their hearts and believe that this is a good new thing. But it, when it, it, it gets to the rigor of science, it, it, you know, it doesn't make it, well, then it, it quietly walks away. But not, not FC, not FC. Yeah. So you've had some like personal experience with being a critic and and um, feeling some heat from the leadership. Or would you be comfortable yeah. talking about that? Yeah. No. Um, well, and, and uh, with that, there was actually a screening at my university, which comes up, which is kind of um, uh, comes up in the same vein, and uh, that it, it doesn't go away and it just keeps persisting. Well, they persist at it. So um, yeah. So. Basically, um, the malpractice article. Uh, so in 1998, wrote that article. It's like, got to record the background here. Because uh, oh, um, I've got a view of it now. I'm the, and I, I really do. Like, I'm the one person on earth who's like looking at this question and dug up this stuff. And I, because I, I was this student at the time. And I was like, OK, I knew what was going on. I knew the science and what was going on. And this is a problem. I'm going to look there and put it together. Done. All right, we have that. It is what it is, and verifiable. Um, and then I looked at the side, uh, the law that was happening, then for the other article, and then it, it, I was doing other things and uh, practicing law and under courts and doing other stuff. But um, and then basically, um, uh, Professor Todd at Eastern Michigan, he he uh, gives me a call. He, he reaches out and he says, you know. And this is what kind of happens periodically. And there, we got another case that popped up, you know. And uh, uh, and basically his, his intro was like, oh, you know, um, yeah, kind of like, you know, you said in that article and whatever uh, that this is this is going to stick, kind of thing. And it's like it's coming back as again. And 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 so introducing that case was the Wendro case, and. That was a little that was different. 2012, or just before 2012, because it came public in 2012. Did we talk about yeah. that the other day, Janice? When we did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and just like the, the one link there is, um, you know, like from my perspective, was, you know, um, the mother was a court attorney, a professional, and uh, the father was a business person. And so these people were not, clueless and, and uh, there are other people who had you know lesser means and educational backgrounds and were migrant workers who got caught up in this and uh, had false allegations through FC as evidence hurled against them and no this is very different uh, FC was solidly rejected he knew uh, from as far as I understand they knew it was and how they you know if you cover this you know how the family went to the local school and said i want this used it works for us I want to use my daughter and so that really just raised uh, the flag i'm like what about liability and you know is it there's another dimension because this kind of uh, looking at the teacher the speech at school when you have a family who's got some agency and they can go to the school and say, hey, we want this. Um, and they won. I mean, you know, uh, just on the pers interpersonal dynamics with the school, as far as I understood, the principal, the school would say, um, it's not valid. We don't, we don't want to use this. But the family persisted, and they got it. And that's happened a million times. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we had all went south, and there were false allegations that happened from that. But that, um, that maybe say oh boy okay we've got to look at the negligence stuff and that's not my area you know so um, the defense work and uh, uh but that's you know uh this is you know the civil side here this is you know what's known as torts um you know someone breaks their leg on your front lawn or at a pool party in your backyard they could sue you that's the world we live in there's civil law and criminal law and i was like we got to look at the civil law on this negligence and you know the thing is uh, what, what, was, what was the neat thing to work about that was uh, uh, there's this educational malpractice doctrine, which you know some people 
you know, they weren't the best students and then they sued the teachers for not making you smart, you know, like, and there are some classic kind of cases and the judges were like, get out of here with that. Um, and that's, uh, the, the, the doctrine comes to mind with cases like that, you know, I mean, and there's really like the one case, uh, yeah, it was like, you know, this guy is like, hey, I'm going for, I think he was applying for a job at Home Depot or something. And he's like, hey, guess what? I, I can't read this thing. And, you know, uh, and then suing the school district, the judge said, no, you got to bring something to the table. So it wasn't about disabilities. It was about someone really kind of like delinquent students, not, you know, um, bringing something to the educational process and saying, you've got to do more to teach me. You were a bad teacher. You were negligent. There's not much to that. The courts aren't going to open up that door. But being that FC is the most rejected, uh, you know, technique in the field, um, and it's so dangerous, that you know it does raise it, it does arguably you know reach a threshold of gross negligence of uh you know being actionable you know and that's very rare stuff because it is out there and it is so refuted and known to be dangerous it's got this history that it's different than hey um the third grade teacher didn't teach my kid how to tell time and i can go you know if that's Stuff, they should learn that in the, I don't know, third grade or something, or write cursively or something. You know, you, you can't have parents bringing lawsuits for, you know, Johnny didn't need he's, he's, he's in the first grade. Now, you know, a technique that it can take away someone's rights that can, and, um, and distribute regarding that risk for the real lived hope um the science contradicts it then that could be actionable possibly it must be it, 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 was um, really it must bring that the, into the yeah it, it must it must change it to that like the american speech a hearing association um, american psychological association there's many others um but um, I think you wrote that in what 2011 ish or whatever and and um, there weren't as many as there are now but but there were some substantial um, professional organizations who came out with policies opposing facilitated communication for the reasons we've talked about so how does that like if if there's a, a speech clinician and or pathologist in the school system that not only is it um, a discredited technique but the organization which with which she belongs to the professional organization also is opposing it so how does does that does that affect it as well it, it matters it goes into it, it, it it's very meaningful um you know because we're, we're trying to distinguish the world of uh saying hey teacher you did teach you know how to tell time mayor to tell time uh, and it's great uh very different teaching is an imprecise art um, but if you're if you are a speech language pathologist and you're duly licensed and you belong to the professional organization and they and this is what professionalism is about they set standards and code of ethics and um, ASHA the speech language group they you know they came out in 1995 I think was the first one um, and with a number of other professional organizations to because there's such push in the fc advocacy community that you know this extraordinary measure had to happen where these professional organizations had to say hey we need to put out these statements and they don't do that for every you know um you know, false junk cure that comes down the pike no, but it's it, this, pretty rare yeah the fc is so persistent that they have to you know do this and make sure this is known and um and so you know, I say it matters because um, the, the example I used in the, in the article is, uh, you know, everyone knows, and it's by statute, if you have a crosswalk, that's where a pedestrian can walk in the crosswalk, and they have the right of way versus a car, okay? And we all know that. That's by statute, and universally. Although, you know, these laws are done by individually in different states, but that's kind of the same thing everywhere. Um, and if a car, you know, it's, negligence per se there ain't no talking your way out of it if you were in the car and you hit the pedestrian and you're both in a crosswalk you know it's it's the standard for what's known as the duty of care you're in a car you've got to be careful to the pedestrians 
in the crosswalk. That's your duty of care. And the, the question in, in the net world of negligence that this uh, article is about is, you know, um, first, is there a duty of care? And, um, and then uh, if there is one, like a pedestrian, a car to a pedestrian at a crosswalk, um, you know, did you breach it? Did you violate it? Did you hit the pedestrian? Oops. Um, and you can't say, oh, it's the pedestrian's fault. You know, they were really, oh, walking fast. No, 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 you're in a car, you're in a crosswalk. You're, you have a duty of care to be so vigilant there. You don't have any excuse. Oh, I was going 100 miles an hour and I couldn't hit the brakes. You were approaching <laughs> a crosswalk. You were marked on the road. You shouldn't have been going that fast that you couldn't have stopped. You know, so every, there's, a, there's an answer that says you're in trouble, you know, in this civil case because of the duty of care that's by statute because it's what that's established with the crosswalk. And so that's the gold standard for that. And it makes it negligence per se. There's no conversation about it. You're responsible if you're in your car, if you're that's true. Mm -hmm. In a similar light, the fact that a professional is, you know, claiming, to, you know, is out there with a license, acting as a professional, and they're bound by the ethics of this organization. And if this organization says, and they said, FC it should not be used. I don't know, I'm looking at E on their you know, uh, latest uh, advisory. FC should not be used. And that was after several other points that it's not valid. So it's not the same as the statutory law about the crosswalk or other duties of care established by statutory law. But um, it's not without meaning to have a professional. And, and, and just from the professional's point of view, um, you know, they want to preserve their license to be a professional. So they have to mind their you know, professional organization and the rules. So this puts them uh, in a conflict, um, you know, because I'm a professional. I have this job because I am a professional. That's how I hold myself out as a professional, as a speech language specialist. But to stay one, I have to follow the rules of my profession. And they say, I can't do this. So that's that. And then if harm comes from that, so if the professional just, this uh, licensed speech pathologist says, well, okay, we'll just do it. Uh, and because of the social pressure in the situation. And harm comes from that, the Wendro case, you know, well, just this once. And then one day, lo and behold, the worst case explodes but um you know but uh in a civil case and someone is uh you know, the question is are they responsible someone responsible and and they have the duty of care and they breach it so professional organizations making those breaching on something their professional standard and when you get to a court uh, and, and there's harm, well, that's the professional. When you're looking at the question, did you take an unreasonable risk? Did you take, you know, was it grossly negligent? Was it, you know, was it, there's a risk in everything and teaching is a precise, imprecise art and, you know, right. speech language uh, and psychologists, they have leeway in what they do, but there are boundaries. And the other uh, therapy, which is not FC, but just, deadly therapy, this holding therapy, which, yeah. you know, oh, something else, yeah. which is a fad therapy that's been out there. And kids have died from that, you know, yeah. and there's various horrible stories. And they, they, mean, they meant well, but they're, you know, I think one case where they're trying to re, uh, reconnect, uh, emotionally reconnect a teenager to their mother, and they said, oh, the, they didn't connect uh, properly after birth. So they, a couple of big guys jumped, uh, you know, they put a 13-year-old, kid under a blanket and they tried to uh, you have to get out it's like you're being born again yeah and then mother will be here and they'll have this wonderful experience the kid dies you know or yeah they suffocate uh, severe injuries yeah, yeah no no it's horrible horrible yeah. but that's, I, that's the yeah we're hearing from um vermont in particular that they're using facilitated communication in some of their designated agencies and they're they're um allowing fc to be used in um in counseling sessions which i think is a is a recipe for disaster and um, we also know that the department of justice has a brochure that for forensic interviews that 
um, allows FC to be used in in interviews for people accused of um, false al or allegations of abuse, um, which I also think is a, a recipe for, for disaster because the guidelines don't protect anybody um, from false allegation. All right. And, and the FC movement, and you really got to look at it as a movement, they're looking, it's, you know, on political maneuvering, it's how to get in there, how to get a, a toehold in there, and the exception. So uh, this, this exception, if uh, they're using it in counseling sessions, oh, that, um, there's, there's, if it's not valid, it's not valid. And then when you're in a counseling session, you're, of course, a mandated reporter, and uh, you should report if you're, you know, informed about uh, abuse of a child. At, or vulnerable adult, but um, you know you're not working with something that's valid to begin with. So why are you going down that road? It, it makes no sense. It's just politically a wedge, a way to get in there. And right. then um, with that, um, I heard this, you know, seen this a million times. Like, oh, um, for folks who encounter this, who just don't know this, and um, it's new to them, but they're a third party, and they're like, well, what's going on here? and they might have some oversight responsibility, and then they just go, oh, uh, well, there's a controversy. And so it kind of gives that third party oversight, who has oversight responsibilities, a way to kind of backpedal. And if there's kind of, oh, this compromise or just in counseling, well, okay. And they get their way out of this sticky situation they might be able to fool about and don't want any part of, because there's such passionate advocacy for it. And then, uh, what's not valid on the other hand, but then the advocates say, oh, it is valid sometimes, and <laughs> no, it's rejected, it's not valid. So yeah. yeah, but they got far with that strategy. I will um, I will point out from personal experience is that they, they don't support the facilitators who get into trouble with it. <laughs> right, I mean, like, yeah, they're gonna cut you, you know, think about, you know, uh, institution what are they going to do if it, like you know i think of the wind case if the dynamic was as i recall you know say uh, the principal kind of it was kind of work with the family and uh, saying no and then there was the okay um you know that that's those are precarious situations the whole way through and then if whoever is holding the bag as it were whoever's stuck and uh, getting the blame no one's going to be backing you up then they're going to all retreat you know that's predictable. Yeah, that, it's always that, what I've noticed about facilitators is that it's always somebody else that's doing the controlling. Like they'll, the, some of them will admit that there's um, facilitator control, but it's always someone else. It's not the person who's actually doing the facilitate. You know, if you ask that person directly, you know, what about facilitator? It's not. It's not me. It's it's all those other people. Oh yeah, not, it's not happening. It's in our real life, our real lived situation here. That it's an exception. Yeah, the that exception strategy. Yeah, that's such yeah. a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there was a a case called the um, uh, with Anna Stubblefield, and she oh, that was um, we're starting to to see not only um, a lot of false allegations of abuse, but now over the last four or five years, we're starting to see crimes committed by the facilitator because they believe so much in the mm -hmm. facilitated messages that they're, they're falling in, they think they're falling in love with their client and they're, they're um, gaining access um, for consent for sexual relationships through the use of facilitated communication, which is also, you know, it's discredited that it's always the facilitator. So oh my God. Um, can you, that was a kind of a unique case. Um, can you, can you give us a, uh, I know, I, I know you weren't involved directly in that, yeah. but just, I know yeah. you've read a little bit about it. Can you give it, kind of talk about that a little bit? You know, I mean, you know, my, my lens for FC in general, like from the early days and it's, uh, through it's a test and i said okay moving forward like fc tests the courts it tests local schools it tests whoever is encountering it because you know it's established that it's uh, not valid and then there's a strong advocacy movement pushing it and very emotionally charged and very effective and uh, very strong and so it's always a test uh, of systems and of, of ethics and professionalism so wherever it goes and um so here, you know, yeah, yeah, the, 
one of the fa uh, fascinating aspects of it is that um, Anna Stubblefield was an insider in the sense that she got on board the bandwagon of professors. So she was a professor of philosophy at Rutgers. Ethics. Yeah. Okay. And 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 so and then she took up on the you know the you know on the academic literature and like when I wrote the 2011 piece and Anna Stubblefield responded and she said that uh, she equated it criticism of FC to hate speech and. Um, yep. So, right, and so there's this academic, you know, from the FC advocacy movement, and, and she was very passionate about FC. And, uh, and the impression was, and, you know, finally, I'm an outsider like everyone else and just read the public stuff, but uh, people who were there in the courtroom, people, anyone who relates to the case, I don't think anyone doubts that Anna Stubblefield believed in that FC was effective as she was using it. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone doubts that, and uh, and then she, you know, fell in love, with, and she had this, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, out of wedlock relationship, this secret relationship with uh, a disabled man uh, that she was helping to facilitate. She thought it was effective, but it wasn't. And then I, yeah, I think the New York Times article revealed that, uh, you know, so she was having this affair, and I believe that affair was going on when she was writing that. She made those comments about oh, our, really? my co-authors. Yeah, and, and there's some history, I think, with her family that goes back, because uh, uh, James Todd was also uh, on the paper. He's a professor at Eastern Michigan. Yeah, we should point out, again, I mean, we've said this before, but we should point out that if you, if you criticize the technique of FC, then yeah. you're automatically, by proponents, you're automatically put in a position of um, what they'll come back at you with is that you're criticizing people with disabilities. So right. they, yeah. they, anti, they, anti disability. Right, and freedom of Ableist speech. Or something, I don't know what they call it. We call it. Ableists, yeah. And, also, and the, they, they very much rely on a, on a, a rights argument mm -hmm. and like you're denying rights. So it's like, no, this is, no, if you act, if you, if you are fighting for, the rights of the individual, then you'd want something that's valid, and that's when you get to, um, uh, you know, like the, the account. Of, there's something called, you know, the accountability movement in education, and you know, for data-driven teaching and stuff as much as possible. They can't say uh, everything has to be data-driven and uh, like that. But uh, the um, IDEIA and uh, you know, there's various. Um, Academic legislation and stuff uh, of late of, of the years, you know, say use data driven stuff, you know, uh, and, and so that is pushing it in, in that direction without a doubt. But um, which is a problem for them. So if you're looking for the rights perspective, well, that's what the gold standard is to use valid uh, teaching techniques and therapies. Uh, so that's, you know, we're fighting for the rights if you're saying let's do it scientifically. And if you know something is not valid, well, you're violating someone's rights by saying, I'm gonna use this thing that, you know, this magic wand, this FC, this unvalid, invalidated thing, uh, because I like it, um, you know, uh, or, you know, in, anecdotally, it seems great. No, that's a violation of rights, you know? So they, they just, it's just politics. But uh, the truth is with, you know, the, the factual stuff. But Stubblefield's case is fascinating because she's a, a true believer. And you know, in terms of knew or should have known, she knew of all the controversy. But I believe her mother uh, mm -hmm. was a proponent of it as well. And I think her mother, who's a professor at Michigan, Eastern Michigan, I think she facilitated with the 14-year-old girl in that Windrow case. I think that's the loop that happens okay. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so it grows a small world. Uh, so yeah, uh, McClellan, if she's the mother, as I understand, she was a proponent, worked with that child, that case exploded. So um, the irony of that, awful irony of that, um, the way that family got involved, uh, and so she believed in it, and then, uh, oh yeah, and then I, I think the New York Times article said that, uh, yeah, the husband came across her notes, and she kept notes about their relationship. Oh. And, yeah, so if you find out about the betrayal, the, the, their the spouse man. cheating, it's there on the hard drive, and I think he sent he sent the, her notes to the district attorney, and then uh, the district attorney was like, hey, wait a minute, this is an, uh, an adult uh, who is mentally disabled, 
So that was a violation of it. So what she agreed to, uh, what I understand was a third degree aggravated criminal sexual assault, which amounted to, um, you know, having sex with someone who is uh, physically helpless or incapacitated or you know, so someone is drunk and they can't consent. These are all if you can't consent scenarios or uh, intellectually or mentally incapacitated. And, you know, so she, she um, made an admission in court and, uh, you know, to, to third degree aggravated criminal sexual assault, according to the public, you know, to the newspaper reports. And that's the, the statutory language there. And so uh, the judge accepts that or not. And the judge accepted that. And so it spoke to one of those things. And that traditionally goes to well, someone who would have the mental capacity to consent. Right. Uh, yeah. But there are nuances with that. Uh, she was convicted and then she uh, was, she was sent to prison and there was an appeal. She prevailed on the appeal. I, I, I can't recall the uh, merits of the appeal, but it was sent back uh, to the trial court, which happens. And uh, usually as a defense, uh, as the defendant, that's a good thing for you. And you kind of have uh, clout coming back to court. You got you know, the wind behind your back if you had a, a win on appeal and you're back in the court. But um, it speaks a lot that, uh, you know, she did, after all was said and done, after the uh, prevailing on the appeal, she did make this admission in court to that crime uh, that they just reported there. And, but, but that was to settle it in terms of, because she's then, I think she was there for two years incarcerated. I think the deal was, you admit to this as an official record. This is what you admit to this crime and time served. You know, so you go home from here, but you're not walking away that there was no crime. And that's when I ended up with a little um, discussion back and forth with the, the philosopher Peter Singer, who was trying to say that her admission in court on uh, that case was, you know, carefully crafted in such a way that she admitted to, you know, and my point back to him in this uh, kind of uh, academic forum was, uh, you know, no, no, no. Uh, if you uh, plead guilty to murder in the first degree, anything in murder in the first degree, you know, th that's the statute that the, the courts don't parse all of this out. Um, you know, you walked away, your criminal record will be murder or arson, or in her case, this third degree uh, uh, sexual assault. Yeah. Um, so you can't pick and choose. And that's, that's, that is what it is. I'm just thinking about that. Even if, even if the child or the, the disabled person had, been truly communicating with her there's still problems with the uh professor and the student having a relationship even still well again well, well the thing is uh well, the nuances yeah. on that oh yeah there's some nuances on that uh so the disabled gentleman he was in his mid-20s so it wasn't statutory any okay. statutory rape um and then also even on that kind of ethical stuff um teacher and student uh that that gets that was, doesn't apply. It was a student's brother. So, and, oh, and this, that's right. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, yeah. and that's what's oh. fascinating about the Stubblefield. She was promoting it in her classroom, in her ethics or philosophy and classroom. She signed up and She said, brother. hey, this is great. Then she got a lead. You know, she right. said, the student said, hey, my brother, this might work with him. And she said, let, let, me, let me meet him okay. and let's see if it works. And the rest was history. Well, wasn't he? in a conservatorship i don't, I don't know because i don't see how you, could, uh, how you could say that he has any competency to agree to anything if he's in a conservatorship i mean can he vote can he can he file taxes can he hold a job can he make legal decisions for his mother if she was to have need of having somebody oversee her could he sign a could he sign off on any kind of contract I'm sure there must have had some legal conservatorship for him because I'm sure they were filing taxes for him being completely unable to make decisions for himself. And I'm, I know there's probably lots of legal reasons, I mean, legal paper signed saying this is not somebody who can make decisions for himself. He can't hold a checking account. He can't get married. He can't do these things under a legal conservatorship. Because she had to have full autonomy over him. The mother had to have full autonomy over this of this person her son 
for medical reasons. And I'm sure he was not in a case where he was able to make decisions for himself. So if Anna Stubblefield is, is making these decisions saying, oh yeah, he's fully competent, we're in love, let's have sex, um, but yet there's a conservatorship on file, I, I don't see how she could get away with that. Wait, yeah, you can't think so rationally about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the oh problem. Right yeah. So, you know, right. And, and so you have like and you describe you know, life, you know, you know the, what it what it was, and before the introduction of this, the exception. You know, I think of the FC. Hey, let's see if this works. Let's see if we have the exception here. Oh, let's give it a try. Let's see if it could like work better. You know, this whole getting the wedge, getting in there, and then um, so sure, all that exists, and that didn't go away, but. You have this enthusiastic believer coming into your life, promising you the world and, and, and giving you, you know, quote unquote proof in front of you. Look, you know, I asked a question. I asked Johnny, what's his favorite color? He said blue. And then, you know, <laughs> then someone around the table says, oh, yeah, oh, he had a blue blanket, uh, you know, whatever. And then people make things true in the Ouija board sense. Uh, so there's that, you know, she was the believer to the way, making it happen. And, and then there was that, well, why not? You know, uh, okay, um, it, the world didn't stop and change dramatically. It, it, there was that one meeting. Hey, I think we, I don't know how it went, but because sometimes it, it, it miracu miraculously worked on the first go. And other times, it's, let's see, uh, let's get the technique down until they think they have it going. So, right, it's so it was slow to this conversion to accepting it. Yeah, I think that's where people convince themselves that they're skeptical because they'll they'll say to themselves, "Oh, I didn't really believe it at first, but then I tried it, and over time, it started to work." And so they've, in their own heads, they've kind of um, the rationalized that yeah. they were skeptical about it, and they then they've changed their mind. So, yeah. so we have a question, well, a statement more more or less from Emil, and I wanted to. Um, insert this in here because Janice and I have been talking about this for a few weeks already. We have, I think we have six or eight videos up on our YouTube channel talking about facilitation in different stages. And we've, we've got so many more we, we need to do. And one of the things that Janice has been talking about a lot is that, and this is coming even more clear in, in this conversation with Brian, is that facilitated communication was debunked years and years and years ago, or 30 years or more. I mean, we know that this is facilitator um, uh, facilitator influence, and and it's not been tested, and all the reasons. But Jana says that what in her mind she thinks happened is the science community said, "This is this is this is pseudoscience. This is this doesn't work," and the science community kind of just said, "All right, let's write up papers on it. Let's do the stuff on it. It's it's debunked. Bye." And then they went on to whatever else they went on. Yet this is. 2020 and we're still Janice and I were, were signed up for a facilitator communication workshop on, over, online yesterday was it yesterday yeah. and it's still there and yeah. somebody somebody has just made a comment saying that it has joined in email says this is still a thing I guess meaning facilitated communication while I I thought that would have been deleted from the professional market by now we all would have thought so but somewhere in there, a ball was dropped. And as you're talking about with Syracuse, you know, getting, getting the money for this for whatever reason, I mean, they could have, it was facilitated communication. It could have been rebirthing. It could have been crystal healing for all we know. It could have been a, any sort of pseudoscience that they thought this is bringing in money. So let's keep it going. Can you speak to what you think where it logically this divide is 30 years ago is discredited and we've shown the harm there's been court case after court case after court case after court case showing this is harmful yet it's 2020 and in july of 2020 we're still seeing workshops for this i i think you got to look at the source where it's coming from because that's where the persistence is it's the flame that won't go out and um I have a bit of a timeline there, but part of that, like my, one of those moments for me was, um, oh gosh, uh, when the, the film Wretches and Jabbers. Yeah. 
We're going to talk that about was that. Another <laughs> yeah, that was another promotion of FC, but they did not mention the term FC That's at right. all. And it was funny, um, you know, so there's an FC movement. The, the, you know, and that people promote it. It's so, and they deal with the science and they, you know, as we said, politically, and they play um, all, all these games with it. But um, they have these movies that promote FC as well. And uh, a professor on campus who's for FC, um, basically there was some uh, email went out some, and it was not about FC, uh, but there's gonna be a screening on this movie and whatever the little uh you know tag phrase is what for it was at the time and so you know i just get get a million emails of, and it just caught my eye and i'm like what am i looking at here and then there was like a trailer i looked at the trailer i'm like i think i'm looking at fc here and then you know i look a little further I'm like i know i'm looking at fc here and I look who's behind it and all this stuff the same people who are behind the fc movement and uh and then so i started communicating i was like wait wait, wait a minute i know what's going on here this is part of the promotion of it. And there's a professor on campus who believes in it and uh, is having a screening to expose our students to it. And I had a hunch, not too critically. So I got, you know, I was doing some internal emails and saying, hey, you know, communicating, say, are we all for, you know, academic freedom and presenting all sides of an issue? And, but I was like, um, we need to show that this fact that it was rejected by the scientific community and it looks like there's a high risk of this thing being introduced as this film and the producer of it was going to be there for the show as well. Oh, how interesting. Uh, yeah. Right, so it was, a, it was a dog and pony show you know, and, uh, and to get people on board and say, this is great, give it a try without mentioning the name. So even if someone, a student, were to Google like what they just saw, no, it was kind of presented fresh, you know? And yep. but then they visually they saw an edited film where it worked mm -hmm. this thing, uh, so I saw all that was going on to you know uh, indoctrinate um, students. So um, I had a little dialogue and said, "Hey, how about you know, we have to show the other side? You know, we have to, the facts about its standing in the scientific community. You know, we'd be uh, remiss if we didn't do that." Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I got that out of it. And needless to say, I went to the screening on campus, and the way it went down, I just sat in the audience, and uh, with and it was a full house, and and I had my agreement that they were at least they're going to do all it was this promotion, miracle, wonderfulness, and see the film, and they're going to hype it up, but uh, I had a promise they were going to talk about. Oh, by the way, the footnote that uh, and that you know. Footnote, <laughs> I say this as a footnote, it wasn't meant to be just this minor thing. It was supposed to be, hey, a, a major thing, a fact about this. And uh, it wasn't mentioned before the screening. It wasn't mentioned after the movie was shown. Uh. It wasn't mentioned before, you know, so the producer was there who, you know, bankrolled it, who has a son that he uses it with. And, um, and, and then this is my favorite. <laughs> my colleague <laughs> on campus who's, you know, managing the event on stage, we saw the film, we had heard from the producer, and the personal stories, questions back and forth from the you know, student audience were like amazed and they were fed more of the miracle. So, you know, it was, um, everyone's on a high. And then my favorite is, hey, look at the time. <laughs> she, she said, uh, you know, oh, uh, no time four o'clock. If anyone has to catch a bus or something, by the way, it's four o'clock. So if you got to run out the doors, and then I was like, okay, that's my cue, hello. <laughs> you know, and then I just stood up in the audience and just kind of did that counterpoint uh, because she also said, come to my office for more, more materials and, you know, I'll get you more of this. Uh, this kind of, you know, recruitment going on for this belief and this advocacy movement. Yeah. And uh, I was like, well, you know, okay, uh, I got an office too, and I got some things for you, and this is what's going on with it, and this is what, you know, um, our obligation as a university to let you know that there's another side to this, and which would be the, uh, the status it has in the second. And what was the response from the audience when you finally got your chance at four <laughs> o'clock to stand up and say your 30 seconds or whatever? 
Did you get oh, feedback well. or did you get pushback or did you get did you get people coming no. up to your office later no. to say what it was just a, it was just the moment of Johnny Buzzkill. I was just Johnny Buzzkill. Yeah. <laughs> the whole, <laughs> Right, they were a little stunned, you know, and there was nothing. There was nothing after that. I um, because a lot of the students there are there because uh, you know extra credit or you know the ways of filling up an auditorium for things on campus and uh, and part of an assignment or something. So they weren't there out of passion to begin with. But the pro that whole uh, movement's operation is to get the hooks in people, you know, any innocent audience, willing audience. And they tried, and they were on the high. They were rising up to join, uh, get on the train. But then I, you know, I didn't get on the other side. I'm a, I'm a I'm a party pooper too. I know exactly yeah, what you're going to. You know, I don't get invited to anything that's yeah. Is that a high five, Janice? Sure. <laughs> high five. It's it's you know we have neighborhood parties and somebody brings up acupuncture or something, and you're just like. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't realize that that still was around. I thought that was debunked years ago. Oh, how interesting. Homeopathy. Oh, I didn't know that we were still giving out sugar pills. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not fun, but I know what you mean. The, um, yeah, it, the pressure it, it, to sit still and be, keep your mouth shut, too, in the audience is like you probably are turning red. Well, I was sitting there, and, and, and it is funny. And one comment, like, you know, so I'm in the audience, and, and, and we didn't know each other at the time, and uh, so didn't know me. And uh, but I heard one comment, just private conversation, like you know, on the stage when they're about to talk to everyone. And I, I assume it was about me, like you know, it was just that um, you know about this apparently about this critic on campus, this uh, party pooper. It's like you know, like, you know, and I've heard this line a million times in the FC advocacy community, like if they just open up and give it a try, and that kind of you know. And the closed-mindedness that a critic would have. Mm -hmm. No, it's not closed-mindedness. This is the way we Science. operate in this society. <laughs> it's yeah. the pillars of society. It's actually, yeah. go, ahead, oh, go ahead, Susan. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that's that's part of why we're doing these talks because I was reading in the literature um, that the proponents uh, there was a it was an article which I I love the article. It's called something like, um, does facilitated communication work according to facilitators? That's, that's the title. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a study, a qualitative study to, to examine whether it works or not. So it's one of my favorite ones. But they, in the article, they said, um, they wondered what the expertise and knowledge of the, the people who are so negative about facilitated communication is. So partly why we're doing these talks is that I know at least in my experience I I expected because I went through double blind testing and stuff and I expected all the worst from the quote unquote scientific community and the negative the naysayers and I have I have been met with nothing but kindness and, we'll and come openness. On. Oh, hug, hug. lots of hugs um, you know it got me Love through you. A, a really tough time facing facing the things that I needed to face, and and um, when when I personally reflect on how I've been treated by the FC community, it's quite a stark difference um, between their response and the the uh, the scientific response, and my own response has been, okay, this bad thing happened but let's try to understand it so it doesn't happen again and see what we can do to, to change it and to, to make sure that um, those mistakes aren't made again. But that's not the, the FC. In fact, I was away from FC for quite a long time. And when I, uh, the Wendro case that you spoke about, Brian, was, was what kind of brought me back into it. I got a phone call from a reporter saying, we're going to air um, about, a story about the Wendro case tonight, and we're gonna we're gonna um, um, comment on your story whether you want to make a comment or not. That was the that was the reporter's response, sure. and so I just find it really interesting that the the um, the scientific community has approached me with, okay, let's figure this out. If you have, I mean, and God knows, like I don't. 
well, I still send a lot of emails, but <laughs> even more emails early on. And there, people were so patient and just like, okay, here's a study to look at and, and read it and, and let me know what you think. And we kind of, kind of just trying to figure that out. And which is not, if, if I was going to promote, I hope if I was going to promote a, a, a magical um, cure, communication technique or cure for autism or whatever it is that, however the wording is, then I would want to make sure if, if, if people are making mistakes with my technique, then I, I would want to make changes in the way that it's, it's being promoted and produced and, and, and practiced, but that's just me anyway. So, um, you know, oh, I don't know. Anyway, that's sort of a little bit of a, I sort of always end these with a little bit of a rant, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Um, but anyway, that's just my comment about the difference between how, and, and the, it's, it, it's a shame. I, I feel really sad for people that I know personally now that have gotten so much pushback um, and usually ad hominem attacks um, by the FC community. And, and it's, just, it's just not the people that I've come to know over the years. Yeah. Um, well, and they've got a, they've got a, a bright line, a uh, dividing line. And when I was that you know, young student uh, in grad school, I, you know, I called up um, Doug Bicklin for an interview. Yeah, yeah, I want to hear the story. <laughs> There's not much to it. So the click of the phone is the story. And I asked him a few questions. And, and uh, they were too well pointed to contradictions in weak points of his, uh, you know, his, his claims and what he said. And uh, when he kind of went to some contradictions. And, and then he, a uh, question or two, it didn't go far. And then he says, uh, I have it written in the, uh, the article. Yeah, uh, that's why it, when you memorialize matters, uh, you know, it's like, do you believe in it? Or are you a believer? Do you believe in it? That was like really that. fascinating. Just that. He wanted thing. to know. Like, Let's cut to the chase. Do you believe change. in FC? Yeah. And, how, and you have to have I mean, the context in time. Well, yeah. And the context in time. And, the, and um, so that, that had to be 1997 or uh, I think it was November of 97 or 98, what have you. And so FC, they were in a rocky position. So uh, the scientific community was coalesced and coming out with those statements. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, recognized now that the mid-1990s FC was unambiguously discredited, rejected by the scientific community. So that's like 1995. Uh, so my, my conversation was two years past that. Though they were on the rocks. That was a rough time. But um, consistent to what you were even talking about before, like how does it keep coming back, um, you know, the four wretches and jabbers, uh, the 2004, I think it came out, really started making the rounds in 2005. There was another article, it, was, it takes a miracle or something like that. Uh, yeah, but I can't they, think of it. Yeah, but they, um, so FC was, they got sued, they got a lucky day in court, you know, all the harm that happened, the notorious uh, nature of it. And, you know, but it was kind of just, they, the doors never closed of the FC Institute. It wasn't a great place to hang out. It was, you know, it was kind of uh, minimal functioning, if anything. But technically, it just still existed, and they, you know, kept the little the embers of their network going, and they never closed the doors on it. Well, they um, even changed the name of it. Yeah, they changed the name. Right. They well, the so name it, of it. And, right, and the trajectory is, you know, they came back in like 2004, 2005 with one of their films promoting it, and it's like it's kind of how dare you and what you that uh, comment that we had uh from a viewer a moment ago was exactly what was said then at the same time professionals folks who had a clue about it before said what that old thing yeah. that's still around that's coming yes, back and i hear that so all the time they persist so we have cycles of that now it's been around so long yeah and i think it's autism, that film is came. Yeah. autism is a world i think is the name of the yeah that's the one and then cnn ran with it i think that one and it got, it got a nomination for academy award or something or it was another one they got a couple of these things but they just go out and promote it regardless and they won't take no for an answer they won't listen to science and they just keep working the momentum that they can as they can and they whatever deal with their their battles but that was the first like resurgence 
that happened. And that was after a good 10 year period. Yeah. And then help me with the name change. Was that 2010, something like that? Uh, I'd, have, I'd have to look it up, but um, I've yeah, got an article is, about it. The, it was deliberate. It, the quote from the, yeah. one of the people that was changing the name was that they did it deliberately to, to fly under the radar. Oh, yeah, so do quite, that's yeah. a direct quote. Um, yes. I have the article. I can. We're, I can. We're on that. We 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 yeah. make no, sure Christine that the names are linked. That. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to act All the changes of the names are linked. If you Google one, you're going to get the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication. No matter what name you change, what name you're using, hand over hand, uh, saved by typing, uh, RPM. Uh, if any of those phrases come up and you're typing it into a Google engine. You're going to get the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication, which is completely beautifully written with citations, as well as a uh, rapid prompting method, as well as lots of different, um, anything associated with facilitated communication. There's a really well written Wikipedia page. And so you can't now say, um, I didn't know. I looked it up on the internet and I didn't see anything because your first hit, or at least within the first three hits, is going to be a Wikipedia page, which clearly in the lead, the clearest language possible says, this is discredited in the scientific community. And in many of the pages, we have a huge picture up there that says, pseudoscience, alternative medicine. It's like a picture that's, you know, a good chunk of the, of the Wikipedia page. It just has those words on it. You can't glance at a Wikipedia page and be a reading person who can read or look at photos and say, wow, that looks kind of negative, you know. You just can't now. So I could see possibly before not being able to get the information, but now you can't Google it without getting a, a well-written one-stop shop of everything. And we even have the cases on there case history this is what happened here's the harm here's the citations to show you how it was harmful read more lots of read more we've had yes. so good news there's a two good news um recently there have been two cases one in pennsylvania and one in new york who um, sued the school system to use rapid prompting method with their the parents sued the school system and in both cases the, the court ruled for the um, school systems because they were able to provide um, appropriate, um, whatever, educational um, programs for both the students without the use of rapid prompting methods. So at least, um, you know, I don't know, Brian, you may know more about this um, in terms of the trajectory for FC and the court system, but at least in, in those two cases, the school systems were able to look at the, the evidence that the school system brought and, and, um, and rule for in favor of the school system. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so, right, these fair hearings, which, you know, so there you are out, you know, fanned out across the country. So you're, you're dealing with the federal, um, laws, uh, I believe, that provide for that fair hearing uh, process and such. With Fry and Daubert, but if Fry and Daubert would be the standards for scientific evidence and yeah, in terms of like a blanket, you know, can FC be accepted as scientific evidence in courts? And basically, if some, if there's a report of uh, sexual abuse, if there's some, you know, and, and, and the, it's scientific evidence if uh, someone is saying, hey, I used this technique with somebody uh, to type out this communication, and this person said it through this technique, then that opens the door to the admission of scientific evidence because this procedure this you know uh, pseudoscience this novel technique is the you know uh, question uh, raises the question of scientific evidence and I don't have an answer for you like um, FC that was a blanket uh, answer that FC cannot be admitted into the courts and actually I'd have to look at the, um, the appellate case in uh, Stumblefield for instance and um, I'm just going by general recollection and you know uh, I, you know, 
I think that was a case where the judge was kind of like, you know, into that situation where a person who's new it kind of says like, oh, well, there's a controversy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's happened a couple of times. And at the end of the day, as of late, the right thing has happened. Uh, so for instance, in the Stubblefield case, you know, uh, the evidence in terms of related to science added up to, there was a you know, violation of law and there was an agreement in court as to what the defendants can agree to. So that happened as you'd expect consistent with science. Um, but the Fry standard, and uh, to get all technical on this, but about half of the states you know, follow this Fry standard. And it's very simple. And it's just that whether or not this novel technique, like I've seen in this case, if it's about any scientific uh, technique, is generally generally accepted in the relevant site uh, in the relevant scientific community. So if it's accepted there, then you know it's good for the courts. If it's not, then it wouldn't come in. It's kind of a very straightforward question. And then Daubert is the other option because each state has a choice of which rule to follow to admit FC evidence or scientific evidence that would be tested as FC. And is that uh, Daubert considers generally accepted, but the idea is that the judge rolls up their sleeves and looks at rate of error and are there controls and, you know, and really kind of takes evidence and can be more liberal in admitting a novel scientific evidence than that kind of more basic uh, black and white rule apply. But there's no straightforward answer, definitive answer in terms of it, it will never be entered into a court of law. No, you can't say that. We have the rules of law, Fry and Daubert, and they set up the parameters for whether or not scientific evidence can come into a case. But anytime there's gonna be, an, uh, like you mentioned, well, in whatever scenario, Vermont or something, or uh, in New England somewhere, that they're just using FC in counseling sessions. Well, when one of those things turns into a worst case scenario, and we have another f a false allegation of sexual, sexual abuse or something along those lines, consistent with the history, well, there's going to be the mandated call to local police. This will be news to them. They're going to take it at face value. And it goes through the whole system as we've seen it done a million times before. And then it gets to court. And then they say, well, you follow Fry or Dauber. So this whole cycle repeats. And the, when, you know, the court cases, you know, um, the, I, 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 it's that, at the end of the day, the, it seems like the courts are getting it right. Um, but, uh, you know, all that can go on with the court case, uh, it, there's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, you could have an opinion on an issue, on an issue of the case. So this is very particular. And, you know, it could seem pro-FC, but it's not an endorsement of all of FC. It's just that in this case, it could kind of go that way. Like the Stubblefield case. Ask them, she won on appeal. Right, uh, but she still has the conviction on her record. Uh, so you could win on an issue that's fought in court, but um, it, it doesn't come down to those bright line rules. It's a process, right? And any and any point in that process, you could have a quote unquote win for the non scientific side, but uh, it's you know it's a very qualified win. It's you know one cog, and then uh, you know so it's not that blanket statement. We would like to hear. I know we'd like to right. hear, but right. we just don't have it. Can't say. Right. Yeah. One of the things that we're getting, we're nearing the end, believe it or not. And Brian had told us on email that he didn't think he could go an hour because there wasn't enough to talk about. He didn't have enough <laughs> content, which I laughed like you gotta be kidding we could probably go for five or six hours but no way <laughs> we're gonna be able to sit here and have listeners for you know obviously we can talk about this again other days there's things we haven't covered but there's a couple things that i wanted to mention really quickly and if anybody has any quick comments that they want to put on facebook you better hurry up and get them on there um is two different things is one of the things that i think has changed drastically and janice and i will talk about this on a, another completely different video is that um, the, I think the tide has changed a lot, not only because Janice and I have kind of changed the dynamics by Janice has found this network of people like yourself, Brian, and lots of other people that we're gonna be interviewing and have interviewed that now know of each other, we're now organized, we now have 
methods of communicating. So it's not a lone person in a university right now saying, oh, gee, they're going to show this movie that's pro FC. And I, it's just me and maybe some of the other teachers in the university. Now that's gone. Now you're going to be, people have, have people they can reach out to where we can put a much bigger weight, uh, a much bigger, uh, it, it, we have a lot more clout than we had before. We're organized, as I said, we have a lot of push that we can do. And one of the things that Janice organized, which I think is brilliant, what we did is that we got all these people who are, you know, have PhDs and are in the field to, to write these letter, this one letter, very well written, that we sent to places like the University of Northern Iowa. We sent it to uh, Syracuse and Vermont and different places. We sent this letter basically saying, you are on notice right now. We know that you have, you know, we made sure that we have received of them receiving this letter. Some of them even responded, I think even just like, well, that's nice. So, but we know that, that they received the, the letter from us, basically putting them on notice that when it happens again, when there is another case that comes through and somebody is, has been trained by your institute, by your facilitators, by, by any way, form, and there's an allegation of abuse that is false and there's harm, you know, the parent had to go to prison or even go to jail for a few days or the children were removed from the home. If there's any harm where it wasn't just like, okay, let's look at this. Okay, it's fine. You know, any kind of harm, they have now legal rights to be able to, you know, we can, they can say, you have been warned. This is, this is not okay. And there's, there's evidence that, the, the scientific community has allowed you let you know this is pseudoscience there's no ambiguity and i think it's going to take one case one time to happen to university of northern iowa or syracuse or something one more case to happen it could happen tomorrow it could happen next week and when it does and the lawyers find out that this letter has been sent to them putting them on notice i think that that might be the end that's how I feel. I'm an optimist. <laughs> I'm going to speak above my pay grade in science, and I have no uh, credentials <laughs> to speak to the physics of this, but somehow, you know, for every action, there's a reaction, or, um, you know, the FC movement, there's a lot of momentum, uh, a lot of power behind it, uh, years behind it, money behind it, a huge networks, not one network, networks, there are academic networks, there are administrative networks, there are people, you know, who are follower networks. There's a lot to that. What you two have done, <laughs> it defies physics to have a counterbalance out of the efforts of two, two folks, you know, um, uh, getting the truth onto Wikipedia and, uh, you know, uh, that, that initiative just, you know, because of where it's so well situated and just have the truth. And then Janice being, as uh, I refer to it, um, the situation as Janice being uh, like the, the hub in a wheel. And we had the academic community of folks and like, you know, we all, uh, you, know, uh, you know, write an article and people have different degrees of being involved, but then we would go on with other stuff. And um, being the hub in the wheel and just a, a bit of connections keeps that, you know, this, um, you know, the, the community of traditional, uh, scientifically oriented academics, you know, connected and focused, you know? So that is, is huge. So just the work of two folks, that says something, <laughs> you know, that there's, they were, you know, no one is minding the store. The FC yeah. movement is going because no one's minding the store and every, and the way things go, they should, you know, disappear, but they keep at it. And then just, you two can do, you know, and I, I know the labor that goes into these things, and but 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 just two people even, you know, um, to counterbalance all of that to some degree, to any degree, um, is quite amazing. So you know, hats off and kudos to you guys for that and appreciation, really. Janice, really appreciate Janice it. is amazing, and and I keep saying this quote, and eventually it's going to be true, is that I feel that the down the end of facilitated communication was when Janice Point met Susan Gerbeck. <laughs> yeah. because i am a no, no nonsense i'm not an academic i'm 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 a big 
big thing, big in the world of uh, psychics. And this is so many, so many parallels to the psychic universe. And having, having uh, this, I have no academic credentials other than I have a BA I've never used for anything, but meeting Janice and help having her be like, this is so frustrating to me and learning about her story. And it's so compelling. And she's such a genuine, wonderful, loving person. And just Janice, just don't listen because it's going to make it's weird. You're going to make me cry. Right there. It's going to make, it's weird talking with you there, but I've said it many times is that she's so generous with her time and her passion and telling this story that's so compelling and when when the wikipedia page was rewritten for facilitated communication back in 2015 and i said this all along and i say this to anybody who's interested in civic science at all in any kind of activism is that if you are really passionate about a subject could it be psychics or homeopathy or rebirthing or whatever it is until the wikipedia page is in order you have you can't start that is the first thing you have to do because people are going to want to understand when you go to the media when you write stories whenever what is this and they want an unbiased place to look at it and wikipedia of course because of the powerhouse it is is going to be the first hit that you get so until that is written in all languages possible that it's applicable in it's another big strong belief of mine it has to be done first. And I'm looking at our notes right now, and you know, I have this all, computers, I love these, these stats. The Wikipedia page for facilitated communication was written in March 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we're at five years. I can't believe I had to count to five. Wow. That was really, that's Ooh. embarrassing. That's really embarrassing, you guys. Um, <laughs> I'm a real that's person. Um, I, I'm lucky I know what month it is. But it's been viewed 297,634 times since it was published. And let me look really quickly at the Wikipedia page for, for rapid prompted method, which is R-A-P-I-D. Oh, I can't spell R-A-P-I-D. Rapid prompting method was a Wikipedia page written in 2017, and it's already been viewed 43,480 times. So somebody's accessing this. Somebody's getting this. I've been on, I've been on lectures talking to people, and I've had in, um, in England, in Portsmouth, or was it someplace in England? I was giving a lecture, and two women came up to me and said, "I understand you're really involved in the facilitated communication world," and I wasn't even talking about that. I was talking about Wikipedia. I was talking about psychics, and they said. I love that Wikipedia page for facilitated communication. I, they said, I get so much information off of it. I've accessed it myself many times, they tell me. And, and it's, it's rewarding to know that that makes a difference. And this all came out because of this academic uh, email that Janice was on with a bunch of different people. And I was at a conference in Poland and I talked to Scott Lillenfield who said, yeah, we're going to write another paper. Or we're thinking of writing a book on this. And I said, you know, I'm sick and tired of hearing you guys writing another paper on facilitated communication. Who do you think is reading that? The academic world who isn't. I said, I'm done. So far. I'm done with this. The I'm academic done. So far. And that's what started it finally is, you know, we wrote the Wikipedia page, but then Janice and I said, okay, that's it. Yeah. Let's be more <laughs> aggressive. And look at this lecture series we're doing. I think that. This is well, a resource and, people don't really have. And and that and the success of this speaks to a truth that should, you know, um, you know, trickle downstream for people watching this, which is um, not to fall for the tactics of the movement, which questions the credentials of critics. You don't need credentials to, you know, uh, know be, and be, be informed that it's rejected by the scientific community. You don't right. have to be the scientist to be a person qualified. <laughs> I just did the study yesterday. You don't need to do a study to be critical of something. It's, you know, we, it's our responsibility. We have a duty, like that civil law stuff I talked about, the duty of care. There are times when we have a duty of care in situations. Um, but we all have a responsibility to be informed, and, you know, we all have the right to speak to, you know, uh, what is factual and true. And 
that's a fact and they don't have a right to say you can't weigh in and talk about it being rejected by the scientific community no that's what society uh should be doing that's uh, everyone is uh to, should who's in a position related to this right. uh, has the possibility to be informed and and, and should speak out we can't we questions. can't expect everybody to be an expert on this but yeah. we do what i what i'm hoping one of the main one of the small things i'm hoping comes out of this and it seems like it is because janice and i hear it all the time is people are saying i didn't know that was still a thing i'd heard of it before or they're learning about it for the very first time and they didn't realize there was harm and they think oh well so it's just somebody who's you know somebody's holding their hand and they're typing out stuff what could be why is that such a big deal but janice and i keep explaining why it is such a big deal and if anything people will hear that that there's that there's some you know that there's an active uh this is still happening and then when they're in their school system and they or they know of somebody this is happening to or could potentially be be um introduced to it you know through the school or whatever now they'll say wait a minute i seem to remember watching facebook one day and i think there was I think this is still a thing and and i think that's a harmful thing i think that's not working something mm -hmm. something in the back of my mind i remember watching this someday let's let's google this let's google hand over hand let's google spelling to communicate let's yeah. let's google that i seem to remember that and they're going to get youtube videos academic papers and a wikipedia page which will break it down and they'll go you know oh this is a problem and janice and i also, we're saying earlier, I'm sorry, I keep talking, even though I said we're getting ready to end this, is that we don't know how many people we've helped because there's a lot of people, well, 200 and almost 300,000 people have read that Wikipedia page or at least looked at it. How do we know how many people have gone and said, oh, they want to start teaching this new procedure to my kid at school, or my neighbor says this is really going to help my son communicate better. And they went and they Googled it and found the Wikipedia page and read even part of it and said, no, I don't think that's for us. And then left. We, we don't know how many people that has happened to, but I guarantee it's happening. You know, I know it's happening. I know people are saying, really? That doesn't sound quite right. I think, I think I'm going to go with something else or no, that, no, that stubble fill thing seems a little too weird. I don't think I want to be involved in something like that. And this happens all the time. And I so just by doing what we've done, I think has improved a lot of lives and has probably saved a lot of heartache. And um, yep. we just yep. don't know, and we will never know unless somebody comes up to us someday and says, "You know, I was thinking about it, but I read this Wikipedia article, and it really, or I read, I watched this video, or I saw some people talking about it on Facebook, and I don't think it's for us." Yeah, and then it's going to inspire more people, you know, to be aware, as you say, and then you know, take up their battles. And right. um, you guys remind me, like, and you speak of the harm and. Um, someone else who's out there fighting uh, on her own, uh, Lisa Brady in New England, and like you know, uh, she's one person who you know, an, an issue with with her her situation, you know, is the science of FC. You know, that's what uh, I understand. And with what what, uh, but she as an individual is you know fighting for what's right in her situation. But it's the science of FC uh, that's at stake, and there'll be more people who, in their individual situations, they come across an injustice and are harmed by it in some way, they can have their battles. Right. And, you know, bring it to court because the courts aren't, you know, it's it goes in and out of the public awareness. You know? Right. Absolutely, and it, and it resurges. And as you said, it comes up in videos without naming what it is, yeah. without the word in there. We see commercials. Janice and I, one of our first videos we did, we talked about an Apple uh, commercial that was all FC. Yes. But they didn't mention SC. It was just some autistic son who, boy, who was able to suddenly be able to communicate now that he has this Apple device. But <laughs> that's the kind of thing that we have to stand up for. And as we get to know each other better and people are aware that this is a thing where, you know, we're fighting back because of the harm, it's going to be more, more, more common to see the, the stories coming through. And I wanted to just really quickly just say this one thing I read in your 1998 paper, and I think this sums it up really good about what's going on. And um, 
this really hit me. So I, I wrote it in pencil because I was writing. So let's hopefully I can read it eloquently. But this Brian Gorman said this in his 1998 uh, article. Not since the days of warehouse institutionalism have the disabled experienced as much power as powerlessness and loss of anonymity as they do with well-meaning facilitators today. And I thought that is really the, the, the summation of this, that if anybody is left with anything um, out of our talk, the idea that these people are, their voices have been taken from them, their real autonomy is gone, and that people, they say they're trying to help them communicate, but what they've done is they've taken their whole, taken their communication from them and replaced it with fantasy or uh, imagination. And my friend um, Wendy just the other day had said um, something else I thought was really eloquent, and I'm going to repeat it here. Wendy Hughes, she has been listening to our videos, our conversations, and she said about one of the videos we had watched uh, with a mother who was facilitating for her son. And, she, and Wendy said that this mother is having an imaginary relationship with her son. That's not, that's her idea of what she wants her son to be. It's not really who her son is. It's power, it's, it's, it's painful. It's absolutely yeah, and I feel it, so it, badly for these parents. Yeah, and, and it's easy to jettison the less glamorous existence. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not glamorous, but FC is the promise of glamour and miracles and everything you want to come true. Right. And I heard one of the, you know, a, a comment not long ago um, from one of the folks at FC at their, that institute, whatever they're calling it now, um, you know, just like after parents go through everything else, you know, they, they've got nothing, that, nothing else to help them, then, we get, then they finally come to us. I mean, like, uh, I mean, just just saying it like it was, I forget what the forum was or what the the talk was about, but I was like, yeah, um, I'm surprised you'd admit that because <laughs> like, the people are the most desperate. We got them, and that's yeah. then they build their. Right they market it as the technique of last resort, and there's always mm -hmm. a miracle at yeah. the end. Yeah, last resort, and there's a miracle, and it's again as I as I keep saying, this is so similar to the world of psychics and the world of. Uh, facilitated communication and psychics, there's so much overlap. These people who are desperate, wanting so badly to communicate with somebody, that they're willing to completely um, ignore the, the sense that this is just the red flags are flying up all around them. But the more they get invested in it with money and time and guilt uh, of, not doing this sooner or whatever. I can't look, I can't look, I can't look at anything other than what is right in front of me because if I do, I will admit that I've wasted time, money, I've taken my child's voice away from them. I can't deal with that. So we have no hope whatsoever and ever probably ending facilitated communication as uh, with these students who, are, who have been invested in it, it's been in their world for so long. That is done. We can't cannot convince those parents. But what we're trying to do is put the universities and anything publicly funded to say, no more. We're no longer sponsoring this. We are no longer going to use taxpayer dollars to fund this and not allow people to continue funding new people into the system so that hopefully this will die off eventually when those people, um, you know, move out of the system, they, they, they move on, they'll go to underground uh, teaching it at home or teaching it through, you know, like, like the Flat Earth Society or something, you know, they'll send out VHS tapes or whatever to each other and new techniques, but slowly it's going to go. And, yeah, and it's got and it. One, and to give you one point for that, I talked about it in the 98 article, which is, you know, um, at Syracuse, they don't have a separate nonprofit for this institute. 
And the law doesn't, you know, it doesn't address everything. It falls into a gray area. But hey, come on, uh, if they're really to be, that, that should, uh, as a matter of propriety, have its own nonprofit status. As other, they have other subsidiary nonprofits. Then you'd get that 990 form, and you'd get the focus on those activities. So right now, it, it's been kind of blended and confused with academic freedom and, and this novel research stage for uh, how many years now, 30 years, and that's ridiculous. So that's one thing, a pointed thing that uh, you, could, you could kind of uh, argue for, that there's no explanation not to have that, because uh, they mix the funds. Now, you know, in, in that article, it goes detail. They get the money, and then it supports the university, and they, they just put it into buckets. And it's basically bring in the money, and then they make things float from it. So, But a 503 would start bringing some rules to the FC money, because it deals with the public. It's not, it's not a class, that institute. They've made millions, or at least hundreds of thousands, from this product sold to the public, not enrollment in a class, those you know, weekend seminars. No, no, no. So that should have its own. Yeah. Agreed. So Janice and I would love to have you back on again. You obviously have so much more information than you thought you had. I think we just started it right. after two hours. I think that we've got We've got lots more where we can go in this. This thing that Janice and I thought we would do over maybe two videos, we're at like six or seven, and, and I have a list in my book that I keep, and I wrote down something else again today about the fry and um, Dunbar. Dunbar. Fry and Dal Dal Dalbert, the, that. I, I want to learn more about that. There's so much more that we need to do. Um, I keep saying that we got to talk about we're going to do a talk on um, idiomotor effect, the Ouija board effect, clever Hans, that kind of thing. We're going to do a talk on that. Also, we were talking about how to, to do a video on how to watch these shows like uh, Jabbers and whatever. Richards and Jabbers. Yeah. How to watch that. How to, because I'm sure there's going to be more commercials and more shows coming out. How do you sit down and watch it and evaluate it you know what is the editing process what are they not showing you again this is all from the psychic world oh my gosh that's crazy world but um <laughs> there's so much there but janice and i thought we would just be done you know and I, oh janice let's talk about it in one video oh janice can, we do another video? janice can we do another video <laughs> But Brian, we really want to thank you. It's, this is yeah. so interesting. I learned so much, and I think this is just a great um, teaser for more, more to come from you. And I think that you've shown again with um, Janice's uh, uh, industry bringing all these people together that I had never heard of, and she's brought in so many people who have different aspects of. Oh, this person is language, this person is law, this person is that, this person is civil rights, this person, and bringing it all together to talk about this with this one subject, it's, it's, it's interesting, I think it's going to be valuable, I think this is a good use of our time during the pandemic, <laughs> and my cat is learning so much, I think he sat through all of these, Hamilton, there's, you can't tell, there's a window right here with a bird feeder, right here it, so his nose has been pressed up to the window almost like right here to the birds that are eating out of the bird feeder and it's hilarious i was waiting for him to go ah, 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 you know whatever the noise i made but he's just he's just he's just engrossed and now that he's settled down it's nice because we can hamilton is just very and i named him hamilton before the the play the show just letting you know the musical yeah my son was really into <laughs> hamilton but we no. usually start and end these with cats. <laughs> we cats, can't have enough cats on the internet. Like, they're like a blessing to us. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I want to thank you again. And for people yeah. watching, please you, uh, share the videos. And please uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel About Time Project, which is in the show notes here of Facebook. I'm pointing to Facebook like you can see it. <laughs> and... Um, We'll have a lot more of these. Turn on your notifications for whenever I'm live or when About Time Presents is live, and then you'll get a little notification. Go to our Facebook page, hit like, and again, turn on your notifications so that whenever we're live, you'll know. But we put out 
we put out these things, um, notifications. I'll be talking to somebody else this Wednesday, and I think we probably have more things on different subjects as well as facilitated communication. We have some very fascinating talks coming up, and um, it, it's, it's an ongoing process. I can, I can announce that we have a, a, our next speaker, I think, is going to be um, Michael Burke from Syracuse. He was a reporter for Syracuse University when he was a student there, and he wrote an expose on facilitated communication. The Daily Orange? The Daily Orange. I so he really, was, that's going to be something else. He's agreed to talk with us, so I'm looking forward to that. That's fantastic. Mike is a great guy, and as an undergraduate, for him to stand up as he did, uh, that that was a brave act. I mean, that's what I guess what a reporter signs up for. And he is an undergraduate. He did his job, and that he did some really good work when he was there. So and we've quoted really him quite a bit in the Wikipedia article because it was it was killer the way he he explained it and the way he just like summed it up for people it was it was for the for the for the student body and it just was well done spot on and i i'm really yeah this is yeah, and, and, so and, much fun. and i believe he earned the the ire of some faculty who are pro fc and you know as an undergraduate to be taken on faculty and their that's beliefs fun. yeah absolutely. that's great uh, that was down. really fantastic work in this book yeah I, I, this is gonna be fun but anyway People anyway, are me sending, people are sending me messages. Uh, Paula just sent me a message for a one way mirror for my cat. <laughs> this world is strange. I, 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 I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We'll be in touch. Thank you for having me. Bye now. <laughs>